All right, well, uh, now on to the really bad news of today's show, uh, like we haven't gotten to it yet, and that is the situation in Yemen. I came across this story at Reuters a couple days ago uh, titled, We Do Our Best, Fuel Shortages in Yemen uh, Make uh, Doctors' Lives Even Harder. And uh, I just what's going on here, Will, is that there's people right now, uh, especially in northern Yemen, in hospitals and, you know, every, everywhere in the world, people have kidney uh, failure. And so this lady's on dialysis. Right. And uh, the company or the, the hospital's uh, power completely goes out while you're on the middle of dialysis. So now the you know nurse or whatever has to stand there and turn the dialysis machine by hand to make sure this lady's blood doesn't clot. Uh, while the you know hospital tries to restore power so you know i i know will you've done some coverage and you've talked to reporters like nasser rb and other people on the ground in yemen about the humanitarian catastrophe over this last five and a half years but this is this is the you know what was being warned about you know three four five years ago will was that the, the situation in yemen is going to get this bad and it's now this bad. So yeah, I don't know what what details do you have on uh, just the the humanitarian catastrophe there. Yeah, that Reuters story was pretty harrowing about like the dialysis and t- turning the machine by hand. The nurse is doing that's incredible. Um, th- there had been, there have been like fuel and water shortages in Yemen for quite a while now, as you might expect in a war torn uh, country with a really bad humanitarian crisis. But uh, since the summer, like over the last few months, the fuel imports into Yemen have dropped off like almost completely. And it's creating this massive shortage where I think prices have actually like tripled uh, over the summer from their previous level, which was already like staggeringly high uh, during the war. Like the the prices were already extremely high. They've tripled since then. Um, This is largely, I believe, because of the Saudi blockade. Uh, the Saudis and their coalition uh, who've been you know, waging war on Yemen since 2015, they control a lot of the airspace and ocean around Yemen. Uh, the Houthis don't really have much of an air force to speak of or much of a navy. Um, so the coalition ends up controlling a lot of the commercial ports as well, and they can block goods from coming into the country. And um, another thing that's not really helping this is earlier this month, too, the Houthis have also halted uh, UN humanitarian flights from coming into Sana'a, the capital, uh, apparently in protest of the Saudi coalition's blockade and blocking these fuel shipments. But I mean, obviously, that has not helped things when they're, uh, you know, halting these uh, additional uh, humanitarian flights. Um, the coalition, though, you know, as well as the the government in exile uh, under uh, Mansur Hadi, that it, it props up. The, the the Saudi coalition has been trying to reinstall this guy into power in Yemen. But they claim their their whole argument in all this is that they only block ships from coming in so they can make sure they don't bring in weapons. And they say that the they've accused the Houthis of like grabbing fuel to sell it on the black market, and that they've just created this whole crisis themselves. Um, I, I don't doubt that those uh, black market sales are happening. That happens a lot with humanitarian aid in Yemen. Some of it gets skimmed off the top and sold. But that is clearly not all that's happening here. And I'm not, I'm not the only one who thinks so, too. Even the UN special envoy, Martin Griffiths, is saying that, like, no, these shortages have to do with the blockade. And he's calling on the Saudis to lift, or at least part, partially lift, the blockade to let in some fuel. Um, but, I mean, regardless of what's driving it, the effect is all the same. I mean, like, obviously, you need uh, you need fuel to transport things from A to B, whether that's a person to a hospital or a good to a, sh- a store shelf or something. Uh, but you also need fuel for water pumps and generators and, you know, like we we're saying, dialysis, dialysis machines and life support machines, all kinds of basic amenities of, like, modern civilized life, which are, you know, it, as if the situation wasn't already worse in Yemen. We have the worst world's worst humanitarian crisis. Now some of those basic amenities are becoming even more difficult to get. Um, you know, just making their plight even worse. Um, uh, I think we did a decent job at summarizing some of like the humanitarian stuff going on in Yemen on uh, episode eight, if people want to go back and look at at that one. I think we also just have a clip too, uh, just focusing on the Yemen part. So people can go to the YouTube channel and look for that. Um, But something like 80% of the whole population of Yemen is dependent on some form of humanitarian aid. So we're talking tens of millions of people who are in like dire situation here. And it's, that's not certainly not new. They've been in that situation for years. Um, like hundreds of thousands of people have probably died uh, between the fighting and the deprivation and everything uh, caused by the war. We don't really have like super reliable figures for casualties. Uh, uh, as we've mentioned before, they rely on uh, health facilities. And over half of those have been put out of commission in Yemen through the bombing and fighting. Um, it's just it's a complete disaster, the whole thing. And the Saudis have done this with American support for five years straight, uh, spanning two U.S. administrations, both a Democratic one and a Republican one. So uh, America's name is really all over the situation in Yemen and all over this fuel shortage, too. Right. And, and I can't mention this enough, as we covered recently, both 
Now, Obama and Trump administration officials have sought legal counsel over the war crimes that the U.S. has committed in Yemen. Uh, the, you know, they're afraid of, of the repercussions coming because, uh, you know, we've essentially committed a, or working on committing a genocide in that country, just a mass starvation campaign against the people. And it, it's completely illegal to do and immoral. And if we were a better society, we would probably uh, set all these people afloat and just make sure they uh, can't come back into our country because uh, just the, the absolute worst kind of people. Now, this is what Reuters was reporting the situation in Yemen to be on uh, Tuesday, I believe. And we got some articles here from Dave DeCamp. They publish at antiwar.com. Um, from Tuesday and Wednesday. The first is that a Saudi airstrike hit a Platstitz factory. And so there, there's not a whole lot of production or anything going on in, in North Yemen uh, that, you know, that would be generating economic, it, it, you know, opportunities for people. But there, you know, are some opportunities. And one was the Platstitz factory and uh, the Saudis decided to blow that up. So, you know, that that's pretty disturbing. It's another, you know, not maybe uh, not as bad as the target. They bombed hospitals. They bombed a school bus full of children at one point. So obviously you can't like it's been a lot of moral outrage uh, from, uh, you know, a group that blew up a school bus to, you know, not blow up like a factory or something like that. But, you know, that's the first thing that happens. But then the the worst news is that the U.N. cuts health care aid in Yemen and Dave writes that the UN said on Wednesday that it has cut vital aid to 300 healthcare facilities across Yemen, and cuts have also been made to the UN's food dis uh, distribution services. Um, and then it says that the cuts are coming uh, because the UN hasn't raised enough money. They're trying to raise $3.2 billion for programs in Yemen this year. They've only raised a billion. However, a lot of that billion has been pledged by countries like Saudi Arabia and the UAE, the exact countries waging this war on Yemen. However, they're only pledging the money. They're not actually coming through with the no donations. And so, I, I mean, it, it, it's like it's bad and then it's even worse. And, and the last one I have here is that heavy clashes have now erupted uh, near Yemen's uh, Hadeda. Adeda is a city that lies on the Red Sea and is home to the key port in Yemen. I think it's the only port in Yemen that could support, uh, you know, like deep uh, bottom boats and stuff like that. Even the, the port in Aden, which is the main port in the south, can't uh, uh, support as large as cargo ships as the port in Hadeda can. So it's very important that this port is able to, you know, have these massive ships come in with the food, medicine, and fuel needed for 28 million people. You know, the, the 28 million people, a huge number of people that live in Yemen. And if fighting is going on around the city, as you know, we talked about on countless episodes of Foreign Policy Focus, Will, it really slows down the aid that could, first of all, just get to Yemen, but once it gets in Yemen, actually leave the city of Hadeda and get to the people, uh, you know, the rest of the country. Hadeda, I think, is like the fourth or the fifth largest city. Uh, you know, the the vast, vast majority of the population lives in other areas of the country, mostly the areas controlled uh, by the Houthis, uh, you know, which struggle to get the most food because they're in opposition to the Saudis and the Emiratis who, you know, control Yemen's airspace and water and impose this just strict sanctions regime. So, uh, you know, you know, well, I, I guess the, the only thing I could say here is I kick it back to you is at least I don't have any more bad news today on Yemen, but it, it sounds like it, it's as bad as it could possibly get there at this point with the, the UN. First, you have you know the, these hospitals that had to shut down because they don't have fuel, and now the UN's cutting aid to 300 more healthcare facilities. I, it sounds like hell. Right. Yeah. I mean, the ones that the, the hospitals that are even left standing, like, you know, that even have a structure left, you know, from not being bombed. Those are the ones that are now being deprived of of these uh, dollars, unfortunately. Um, yeah. I mean, like it's it really is unfortunate. I've seen also like, yeah, this this, uh, you know, a, a series of reports recently on how like fighting is, is flaring up again. The clashes are, are starting up. There was the uh, report of the, you know, the, the plastic factory was destroyed. I also saw this week there was a report saying the Saudis had bombed over a, or nearly a thousand farms in the last couple of years. 
Um, so, I mean, obviously hitting civilian targets is not uncommon for them at all, for the coalition. They've bombed homes and funeral processions and, like you said, a school bus and, like, cult, ancient cultural sites, UNESCO heritage sites, all kinds of every type of, you know, uh, civilian structure you could hit. They've bombed it and they've done it consistently and repeatedly over five years. Um, and now the Houthis do sometimes hit back. They do launch these, like, crude missiles over the border into Saudi sometimes, which they have also been doing recently. That's, you know, they've been launching those attacks. Uh, the Saudis usually say they intercept those. Uh, but sometimes they do damage, like they've hit a couple oil facilities before and other important economic infrastructure, which like, to be fair, that is civilian targets like the Houthis are when they're bombing like an oil facility or something that is that's not a military target. However, the strikes have killed far less people compared to the coalition. They're not flying like air raids and sorties and stuff. They're shooting these like fairly crude missiles. Um, I mean, they have had some slightly more sophisticated attacks. There was one like really wide scale one with drones that seemed pretty like fancy. But again, these things are not inflicting any kind of like, you know, nowhere near the, the types of civilian casualties that the Saudis and the coalition have. Again, all with American support and British support and, you know, uh, with the UN basically looking the other way. Um, and I don't, I don't know how this ends. Like, it, this has seemed to me, like it seemed absolutely intolerable since like the first year of the war. And we're now, in, we're making our way through the sixth year now. Like it's, it's still grinding up. And I really have not seen anything recently or in the last you know, six months or so that would convince me that this is going to end anytime soon. Very occasionally, the, the Houthis and the Saudis will make some overtures to talks and negotiations and stuff. But it just doesn't like that's happened. That Those have come and gone and nothing has happened. It's not ended the war. There's been no ceasefire or anything like that. So honestly, I don't know how this ends. I, I don't know what, what the resolution is to this conflict. Right. Well, you know, that's one of the things that I think stands out most is that it's not even like there's a realistic solution that anybody seems to really be suggesting. Um, the, the powers that be, Saudi Arabia in particular, uh, has absolutely the, the most leverage on what happens in this situation, other than maybe the United States. But actively, Saudi Arabia is the biggest player and, you know, gets to kind of dictate what's going on. And so long as they maintain that Mansour Hadi has to return to power in Yemen, it, it, that's not a viable solution. So it means that there's no real way for this war to end, you know, until I guess at least they're willing to look at putting somebody else in charge in Yemen. Uh, Maybe but, they should do an election or something. Like, you know, <laughs> try that out. Right. With with, not, with more than one person on the ballot. I'm like when Hadi was elected with, you know, the support of Hillary Clinton hailing democracy in Yemen, one man on the ballot. Give you know, well, we, we shouldn't name the show like Blame Hillary Clinton or something. Just every <laughs> single thing we talk about, go back and explain how this was all Hillary Clinton's fault. But to explain how this was all Hillary Clinton's fault in 2012, <laughs> when the, uh, you know, Arab Spring came to Yemen, the longtime dictator was actually deposed, injured pretty significantly in a, you know, attempt against his life. And That's solid. Yeah, and Hillary Clinton came in and took his vice president and put him on the ballot against absolutely no one and helped him win a one-man election, declare uh, democracy in Yemen, and then just kind of let the things happen in Yemen that happened. And, of course, the, the man who was elected on a, on a one-man ballot turned out to be pretty much the same dictator as they had before, except he wasn't as tactful at it and, you know, made a lot of people mad, including the Houthis. And he kept picking fights until he lost his throne. I mean, he, you know, he was he was just being too aggressive, too big for his britches, and uh, it it came back to bite him. And rather than you know just accepting the fact that you know our sock pop sock puppet got chased out out of Yemen, we just demand that he be returned to the throne. And it's absolutely absurd and stupid that that would be something that happens. You know, especially after all this time of essentially him greenlighting this uh tragedy that's unfolding in Yemen you, you you would have to imagine that had you know he said that I don't want the Saudis to do this and was making a big sting publicly well I guess Mohammed bin Salman probably would have tried to kill him if not actually just kill him but <laughs> assuming saw, assuming yeah. that he lived that that that's a pretty meaningful thing to say is that this war is being waged essentially on your behalf at least publicly on your behalf and you say, I, I, I don't want to do it anymore. That That's very meaningful. And uh, that that's not going to happen because I think he still thinks he's going to come back to power somehow. Yeah, that's right. He wants to be back on the throne no matter how, you know, no matter how big the mountain of corpses, no matter how large the river of blood that it requires to, to do that. So, yep.